Good evening. Welcome to St. Matthew's Lutheran Church here in the heart of Southwest. I'm Thelma D. Jones, the founder of the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Fund. My apologies for the technical challenges, but we hope that they are okay and that we will have a wonderful meeting that we always do, even if we have issues with our technology. Today, we are celebrating Women's History Month with the spotlight on Black women thriving east of the river. How many of you are familiar with this wonderful organization? Okay, wonderful. And for those that have not heard about it or not familiar with it, we'll get a chance to hear about it from our guest speaker, Nikisha Neal Jones, who is the executive director of Black Women Thriving East of the River. Our theme for the evening is women who advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And when I look around in the room and probably on Zoom and Facebook, there are a lot of women here and men, but since this is Women's History Month, the focus is on women that are doing just that, advocating for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I'm not for sure if our guest speaker will really define those for us in the context of the theme and the evening. Um, if so, that would be very helpful of her so that we're all on the same page here. Um, we are here at St. Matthew's Lutheran Church, as I said, in the heart of Southwest. It is a church that actually for many years I attended. So this feels like home for me and I actually live one block south of here. We want to thank the members of St. Matthew's Lutheran Church for their help, particularly Jim, who is working with us on our AD. Thank you, Jim. We will have our opening prayer by Reverend Dr. Burl Dennis, who is with Burl Dennis Ministries, LLC. And Doc, Reverend Dr. Dennis is coming to us um, virtually. Dr. Dennis? Yes, thank you, you so much. I'm right here. Let thank us you. pray. Lord God, we are gathered together today to give you praise and thanks for your loving kindness to us. Make us aware that it is not just what we do that is important, but how we do it. And that's why we say thank you, God, for the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Fund. Help us to be courageous and strong, caring, passionate, and compassionate, whatever our circumstances as we recognize and celebrate Women's History Month. Let us bear witness to your love for all people so that we may be peaceful and joyful and hope-filled women. Help us to draw close to you. Please come and speak your words of wisdom into our lives. Help us to embrace one another, our similarities, our differences, our concerns, and our joys. We long for your touch in our lives, that we might be your hands and feet to the world. Inspire our hearts, heal our wounds, bring peace into our worries and your hope into our disappointments. Come Lord and weave your love into our fellowship together that we may overflow with grace and allow your truth to light up our lives. Bless our leader, Thelma D. Jones, and all speakers and performers and attendees tonight in person or online as we gather. Please give us your perfect peace as we trust in you, Lord. Help us to keep our thoughts fixed on your goodness and your grace. In the midst of uncertainty, give us assurance knowing that as we trust in you, 
we have hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Dennis, for that warm prayer. And we understand that you well, you have another commitment. So thank you for staying on mm -hmm. until thank we you. can hear the prayer from you. Amen. Earlier, thank you. Earlier, I mentioned about the great program that we have before us. Let me just tell you, share a bit about the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Fund. I know everybody knows all about us and you've heard the spiel, but we do have a few new people. Um, who know a lot about the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Fund also. Um, but in case there are some new people, uh, let me again welcome all of you, whether you are here in person, on Zoom, Facebook, on the telephone, regardless of where you are, we want to thank you for being a part of, of this evening as we celebrate uh, Women's History Month with the spotlight on Black Women Thrive in East of the River. The Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer uh, Fund was created first as a support group in 2010, and it evolved to a full-fledged organization in 2012. Our mission then, and it's still the same now, is to improve, is to advocate and improve the overall health and wellness of women and men. And we do this through outreach, support, and education. And I don't know if you've had a chance to read an email that I sent out earlier where we announced our new logo, which I hope all of you like. So this logo sort of encompasses our beginning and it's helping with a forward look as we continue our mission work into the future of having a world free of breast cancer. And if you haven't had a chance, this morning, our newsletter editor, Lashana Thomas-Walker, as usual, did an excellent job, so please, if you haven't uh, had a chance to look at it, please do. And we feature our guest speaker, Nika Natasha. Nakasha. Nakisha. <laughs> I know your name. <laughs> Nakisha Neal Jones. So please have a chance, get, uh, ha take a time to look at that. Um, we also have some opening remarks by two of my great friends. I hope both of them are still on the line. First, we will have opening remarks by Mae McCarmu, who is the founder and CEO of Tiger Lily Foundation. How many of you are familiar with the Tiger Lily Foundation? Okay, well, you're gonna learn about it from the number one person there, and she's my number one unicorn. So Mama. Are you there to tell us about Tiger Lily? Okay, and I'm just trying to look to see if I see her name. So maybe Mima hasn't arrived yet, and I probably should check my phone to see if she's lost or trying to find a parking space. But we will return later on to uh, to Mima and to learn more about Tiger Lily. Next, we will have my dear friend, Anye Iwalia, 
who, or I should say, uh, Dr. Anyeri Walia, who is the Assistant Professor of Medicine, Allergy and Immunology with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Anye is also the daughter of Dr. Ngozi Okanja Iwelia, who is the Director General of the World Trade Organization. And I could tell you quite a bit about both, but to avoid stealing your thunder, Anye, I will let you tell us. So I think we're in the allergy season and you can tell I'm sounding sexier than I normally do. <laughs> it is because I have a terrible uh, sinus infection. So what an appropriate time to have one of the best in the world here to give us opening remarks. Anya? Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And good evening to everyone. So as you heard, my name is Onyinye Iwala, but I do go by Onyi. Um, and as you heard, I'm a faculty member and assistant professor of medicine and allergy and immunology at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I'm also a diversity officer within my organizational unit at UNC. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later in my remarks. But I'm truly honored to have been invited to participate this year in the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Fund event that's recognizing and celebrating the importance of women who advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion. I think it's something that's very important for us to acknowledge and recognize during March, which is Women's History Month, but really every month, and maybe even every day of every month, this is something that should come to the forefront. And I also want to commend Aunt Thelma, my Aunt Thelma, for her bravery and courage for shining the spotlight on an issue that often feels like it's under attack these days. Just this afternoon, I heard on the news that the governor of Alabama has signed into law an order that prohibits diversity, equity, and inclusion activities in state institutions in Alabama. So I just commend you on highlighting and spotlighting this issue today. So it's no secret that women play an integral role in organizing and promoting and executing projects within the equity, diversity, and inclusion space. And when I think about my role as a DEI officer, I have to acknowledge that I stand on the shoulder of giants and, and female giants. If you look at statistics, according to a career and employment website, zipia.com, the majority of chief diversity officers in the US are women at about 54.5%. And on a side note, they actually make on average $7,000 less than their male diversity officer counterpoints. And I think this statistic speaks to our continued need to bring attention for the need for equity in all spheres of life, including in professional compensation in all uh, professions, but especially amongst diversity officers. But to me, it also speaks to how willing women are to essentially volunteer their time to support and to do what's right for their families and their workplaces and their communities and for society. And in my opinion, there's now there's no better critical example of this critical role of women in equity, diversity, and inclusion than Thelma D. Jones. And so I have to pay tribute. Um, and you may already know this, but she is a 2023 winner of the President Joseph R. Biden Presidential Lifetime Achievement Award in recognition for over 4,000 hours of community service. And when I think about Aunt Thelma, as she's affectionately known to me and to my three brothers and women like her, I know I have big shoes to fill. Because Aunt Thelma is what you might refer to as an OG when it comes to DEI. And you know, what do I mean by an OG? Well, OG stands for original gangster. It's a slang term for someone who's essentially a pioneer or according to dictionary.com, someone who's incredibly exceptional, authentic, and an expert at their craft. And Aunt Thelma was working in a volunteer capacity, mind you, as an equity, diversity, and inclusion officer throughout her career at the World Bank, even before we had the terminology to describe the position. And so she understands firsthand what it means to organize grassroots efforts within the corporate or professional sphere 
as well as within the community space to ensure that equity, diversity, and inclusion is at the forefront. And just to give you a taste of some of the things that she accomplished at the World Bank, she demystified the World Bank and established connections between the World Bank and members of the DC community through tours for community members, including students that were involved in the Southwest Neighborhood Assembly. And when it came to promoting a spirit of inclusion within the workplace, she created what we would now call affinity groups for African American World Bank staff and IMF staff and organized the first Black History Month celebrations, as well as annual Kwanzaa celebrations. And through her work and dedication to this growing organization, the Breast Cancer Fund, she's created a community for breast cancer survivors and their caregivers and beyond, including comforting and advocating for all sorts of people who are dealing with the cancer diagnosis. And so Anthem has made an indelible mark on this community as she works tirelessly to bring information and resources to cancer patients and caregivers and to provide a voice and to amplify the voice of cancer patient survivors and their caregivers. And I really think that her accomplishments in this space outline critical elements that women strive to improve whenever they take on DEI related tasks. So things like improving workplace climate, and forging connections between large organizations and the communities in which they're located. So now I'd like to switch gears and tell you a little bit about myself, first from a personal perspective and then from a professional perspective and how I view my role as a woman working within the DEI space. So from a personal perspective, as you heard, I'm a, the daughter of a woman who's a true trailblazer and that's Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iwala. She is the first African and the first woman director general of the World Trade Organization. And she sends greetings to everyone and she sends big hugs to you, Anthama. Um, and I'm also the daughter of a man who not only talks the talk about equity and partnership with his spouse in career and in life and in marriage, but he also lives that life. And that man is my father, Dr. Ikemba Iwala, who's a neurosurgeon and a family medicine physician and an emergency medicine physician, and he's now an entrepreneur running Capital Surgical Centers in Nigeria. And the way that he and my mom worked as a unit and continue to work as a unit to ensure that our family runs well, but at the same time, allowing space for their careers, and in particular for my mom's professional career to flourish, to me, that partnership is a phenomenal example that I strive to follow and try to model in my own relationship with my husband, who's a neurologist, and our three children. And from a professional perspective, as you heard, I'm a physician. I'm an allergy immunology doctor and a researcher who specializes in immunologic diseases. And I care for all kinds of patients with allergies and deficiencies in their immune system. And I have particular expertise in conditions called mast cell disorders. And I find that the vast majority of my patients are female. And there's not a day that goes by when I'm not confronting issues related to healthcare inequities that are faced by my patients, either for them trying to get care or to try to follow care guidelines that are given to them by specialists like myself, or even having access to specialists like myself. And then I serve as the Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for my organizational unit within the UNC School of Medicine. And so I'm the DEI champion um, and the director for the Division of Rheumatology, Allergy, and Im Immunology, and for our Thurston Arthritis Research Center within our Department of Medicine. And so I'd like to spend the rest of my time sort of describing my efforts within this role. And so in this role, I, I serve as a cheerleader of sorts. I try to highlight the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion to all the work that we're doing, caring for patients and creating new knowledge related to the diseases that we treat and that we're interested in. And I consider myself lucky to work within this academic environment as a diversity officer. And that's because even though the political headwinds and the resistance to even using terms like diversity, inclusion, or equity have been blowing very hard in my current state of North Carolina, as they have been in the rest of the United States, like I opened with in Alabama, in Florida, 
my division and my research center understands and they believe that the diverse that diversity in its broadest sense so embracing a range of backgrounds and life experiences this is critical for our mission to advance research and education and to deploy our clinical expertise and so we have several projects and approaches that we take to make sure that advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion is a thread that actually weaves its way through all the elements of our division's activities and functions. And we're actually fortunate to have a vice dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion at UNC in the School of Medicine, who's crafted a framework that's composed of five pillars that really helps us conceptualize the types of work that we do when we're promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in the School of Medicine. And so these include things like infrastructure for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And by this, we mean, do our leaders, do leadership within our organizational unit, do they demonstrate a commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion by allotting financial resources and personnel? And I'm happy to say that I work within a division that does this. Secondly, in terms of curriculum and scholarship, this is where we think about how we're integrating topics that are related to equity, diversion, di diversity, and inclusion into our research and into what we teach our trainees. So medical and graduate students, clinical fellows, our postdoctoral research fellows, as well as our faculty and our staff members. And then when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion in our work climate, we're constantly brainstorming about how we can create an environment that allows everyone to feel safe discussing uncomfortable topics. Because we truly believe that the only way we're going to address things is if people have frameworks to discuss these topics and if people actually understand that things like macro and microaggressions, they're not just theoretical, they happen to people that they know and people that they work with, maybe they are happening to them every day. And so we all need strategies to learn how to be upstanders rather than bystanders when we witness injustice, and that this takes practice and it takes commitment. And then access and success. So in thinking about this pillar, we think about how we can engage our future learners, even starting at an elementary or high school level, college students, as well as our current learners from all backgrounds, and how can we provide them with equity of opportunity to see if they're interested in entering the biomedical space. And so we participate in mentorship programs, as well as National Institute of Health sponsored research programs that try to target people who are traditionally underrepresented in biomedical sciences. And then finally, community engagement. And I feel this is where organizations like the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Fund come into play. So within UNC and for my organization, we have our Thurston Osteoarthritis Action Alliance that tries to focus on health disparities in osteoarthritis and work with the larger community in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and beyond to try to tackle these issues. And we also have a stakeholder advisory board that's actually comprised of patients with allergies and with rheumatology diseases. And we meet periodically with our patients, um, researchers, healthcare providers, and leadership within our unit meet with the patients on this board so that they can ground us and they can provide us with perspectives on some of the challenges that they face from an equity standpoint when they're trying to get healthcare. So at the end of the day, my goal as a DI officer, and I think the goal of all DI officers is to do what we can in the spaces that we work in to create a nurturing and welcoming environment. And at the same time, you know, I know I'm biased, but I'm going to say it. I think that women DEI officers are also more willing to speak the uncomfortable truths that have to be said. Um, they're able to couch things and put things out into the open that need to be discussed in order to push our society forward. And I, I recognize I'm preaching to the choir here, so to speak, but ultimately all of us, women, men, non-binary individuals, whether we're diversity officers or not, we need to speak up for equity and diverse viewpoints in the broadest sense, because it's only through embracing a range of life experiences and perspectives that we will truly push ourselves and our families and our communities, our country and our world forward towards justice and progress. So thank you all for your time and attention. And thank you again, Aunt Thelma, for this invitation.
Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Um, what a wonderful opening remarks. I mean, I'm sit standing here thinking, my Jesus, that was a little girl once. And now um, look at her. Um, one of the things that I should share with you. So um, Anya's mom and I, Ngozi Okanjo-Ewala, um, worked at the World Bank together for years. And the system went out when she was saying that her mother is the first Black first woman um, to head the World Trade Organization in Geneva. And I am so honored to have or to be a close friend of those, uh, of the whole family. We spent many Christmas and Thanksgiving and other family events. I remember one of the biggest and first major events that I attended, and this tells you how long ago it was, um, they were celebrating the graduation. Uh, so Ngozi and uh, Kimber uh, were celebrating the graduation of their children. All four of them graduated from Harvard University. And I know. Uh, <laughs> and so Anya is a replica of her other siblings. One of her brothers, the oldest, Uzo, wrote a book called Beasts of No Nations. And it was about a child soldier in West Africa. And it subsequently became uh, a movie, a film on, uh, what was it, Netflix, Anya? And I'm happy to say that- That's the correct, yeah. It was the first Netflix movie, that's correct. Yes. Um, and I'm happy to say that because I had an inside connection with them, that uh, we were able to host a book signing for Uzo at the World Bank. And according to the World Bank Publications uh, Department, it was the highest selling book uh, at the time. So I was very happy that the World Bank IMF African American Association, an organization which I founded at the World Bank, um, was able um, to to host that. So can you please say hello to the family and to tell Ngozi, uh, we are waiting to know when she will be free to be the guest speaker. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I'm sorry that it cut out when I was saying that she sends her greetings to everybody and also sends you big hugs. Thank you. Um, so, and because there were a few key times, especially when you were talking about me, uh, that went out. <laughs> um, I'm wondering maybe next week, if you have time, because I know what you have to do the rest of the week and the weekend, could you send us a copy of your speech? And I'd like to send it out to my distribution list, which has a few thousand people on it. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm so sorry that it cut out. Oh, no. No, no problem, but that's okay. So not only will the group here get to see it, and that's on Facebook and Zoom, but we'll share it on a broader level. So I think everyone would really appreciate uh, seeing that. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's wonderful to be connected to a family like that. And can you imagine? All four of them graduated from Harvard. <laughs> okay. Um, so next, and I'm going to come and have a seat. Not that I'm suggesting you're going to talk a long time, but I, I, okay. But next, we're going to have greetings from Alejandra, Dr. Alejandra Utado de Mendoza, who is an assistant professor at Georgetown University. And Alejandra and I, like Onye, and the rest have spent a lot of times and hours in the trenches together, and we're still there. So I'm very happy to welcome Alejandra here. Okay. 
Good evening, everybody. It is my honor to provide the greetings today and to be here at the Thelma Lee Jones uh, Breast Cancer Support Group. As I think I've shared in the past, I met Ms. Jones eight years ago when I was pregnant and I had just started doing cancer research and I had the pleasure to meet Ms. Jones. We were working on a project to understand barriers for initiation and adherence to hormonal therapy among black breast cancer survivors. And I had the chance to come to one of these support group meetings, which was in person. And, and it feels like this, it's been a while. Uh, so it is great to be in person again. And since then, um, as my kid has grown, my personal and professional relationship with Ms. Jones has uh, grown and flourished and expanded. And we have been working together on many, many different projects with Georgetown University, including uh, developing a COVID-19 website for Black and Latino breast cancer survivors. And this was in the peak of the, of the pandemic. Also a peer-led survivorship coach intervention for newly diagnosed Black breast cancer survivors. We also have worked in a project to uh, understand the impact of acupressure. What was that? <laughs> um, so another project that you might have heard about is uh, to understand the impact of acupressure to reduce symptoms in Black and Latina breast cancer survivors. Also another one on strategies to implement genetic cancer risk assessment in community organizations. So it has been a plethora of uh, projects and I am very grateful and I want to share how the contribution of Ms. Jones and the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Fund, Fund has been absolutely key in the developing of these projects. She has always made sure that research uh, has its meaningful, it is impactful, and that it resonates with the community, and especially making sure that research is beneficial to all populations. Um, and as I think about everything that we've done together. I welcome uh, new projects and new ventures uh, to reduce disparities within the Black, African-American and Latina breast cancer survivors, as I'm also welcoming my, <laughs> my new baby. <laughs> it's like five months old. So to me, this feels like a full circle when I think about being here like eight years ago even more pregnant than now <laughs> I think I was like seven months um, and thinking like all I have learned uh, with Miss Jones and all the path that we have worked together and thinking about what the future entails so it's my pleasure to be here and thank you for all the support and I also want to say how I've witnessed firsthand how Miss Jones is a rock how uh, everybody can uh, find support in her in the most difficult times and also I praise your role as a bridge and how you connect us all and bring us all together. So thank you, Ms. Jones. I'm going to become the auntie. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you again, Alejandra. And what she was talking about, we first met uh, with her first pregnancy and she was literally at the hospital getting ready to deliver and she's still on the phone <laughs> answering people about the survey um, that I was putting out names, putting out on my breast cancer list to help recruit uh, breast cancer survivors for the survey. And uh, she was so involved and engaged in it. Her doctor had to tell her, you're getting ready to deliver a baby. And, you know, kind of like, can they wait? Can they wait? But so you're talking about passion and commitment. I mean, that gives passion and commitment a whole new meaning. So thank you. And uh, through Alejandra, I've also got a chance to meet her parents who, um, and I should say thanks to Alejandra who has, did pres who has done presentations both in Guatemala and in Spain through the virtual format. Um, she has ex helped to expand our reach and was honored when I invited her mother in Guatemala, who's done a lot of work too around diversity and advocacy. So um, I really appreciate that. And of course, wink, wink, the good paella <laughs> that her dad does. So that, thank you again. And so now we're going to uh, switch from hearing the great voices of our speakers before to another great voice. And this one is a musical one. 
And this is the voice of Cecily, who is a vocalist, a songwriter, and a voice teacher. And if you've been participating in our meetings for the last 10 or so years, you've heard Cecily sing many times. And so she is not new. She actually grew up here in Southwest, about three blocks over. And then of course, as her career started blossoming and performing at places like Blues Alley that she does annually, uh, the Howard Theater, she's performed in LA. She's also sort of been like an ambassador and traveled to another country. Um, I could go on telling you about the great things that she has done and she's continuing to do, but I'm going to welcome her here and hope you can just briefly tell us about your new LP that's out. Okay. So, welcome, Sessie. Thank you, Bethany. I'm going to use the microphone if that's good. Uh, I have a new song that came out uh, about almost two weeks ago, about 10 days ago, and it's called A Flower of Winter, and it's the second single of my, my LP, as you said, that's coming out in a couple of months. And this album is inspired by the work of Bell Hooks, specifically the book All About Love. And yeah, the Howard students know. <laughs> and uh, every song on the project is either directly inspired or by a quote or a theme from the book. And so I've kind of paired each song with a quote. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the quote that has inspired this newest single is, rarely if ever are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. And I thought that was very apt to the space that we share here tonight and everything that uh, film does really is about community and healing and bringing people together to support each other. Um, the music itself may not play very loudly, but I'm gonna try to get you guys to hear both me and the music. But uh, this is a flower of winter and you can listen to it any way you want to listen to it. YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, all the places. So thank you. Breath of relief, 
Now, be honest. Did, could you imagine a little pint sized lady like that with such a wonderful? <laughs> that's a compliment, <laughs> boys. So, thank you. And Cecily will be back to sing one other song before the evening ends. And I don't know, did you bring any of you? Okay, I'm just going to stop promoting you. <laughs> she just cannot seem to remember to bring them. Okay, I understand. Um, but she does have a website, and when she returns, she'll tell you about her website. And um, you can feel pleased to visit her on the website and learn more about her, or you can just continue. And now we are approaching another great part in our program where our guest, Jill Jones, um, who is the executive director of Black Women Thriving East of the River. I don't know about you, but I just love that name. And I guess I started working with you probably around 2018 and 19, when the Jane Bancroft uh, first introduced this initiative. And I think it was introduced, I want to say at a GW uh, equity coalition meeting when I um, first met Cara. Um, so I've 
been sort of on the surface of it, following it, and now it has uh, blossomed into a wonderful organization under great leadership that I'll just tell you a little bit about, because I'm sure she's going to want to tell you about her evolution. Um, Nikisha was at one point in a leadership position with public allies, and I'm sure she'll tell you about that. But I had the great opportunity of working with public allies in the 1998 while I was with the World Bank Group and had been asked to be uh, one of the founders of the World Bank's uh, Institutional Outreach Program. And when we were reaching out to people in the community who could take our hands and tell us about the city, Public Allies was one of the people that we met with. So I've always had fun memories and appreciation of you. Um, Dakesha is also a graduate of Duke University out of Durham, North Carolina. North Carolina is my home state, and I lived in Durham also uh, for a couple of years where I graduated from the Junior College of Business. And there she studied, uh, she completed her bachelor's in public policy and African-American studies. Isn't that an interesting mix? And then later on, she received her master's in public policy from Georgetown University. She is also a member of Leadership Greater Washington, which I share with her and Kathy DeVoe, who's the treasurer of my organization, is also a member of Leadership Greater Washington. And I could tell you some more things about this great lady, but I should also let you know that she is a native of DC, born, bred, and raised. And she now lives um, in, uh, east of the Anacostia River. So this is a person who is bringing to bear total lived experience and working in a community that she knows well. So please join me in welcoming Natasha Neal Jones, who will tell us not only a bit about herself, but about the great work that Black women uh, thriving east of the river is doing, and more importantly, how we can help her in her mission. Natasha. It's, we need to lower the podium for you. No, we can't. <laughs> Can you see me okay? For the people in the room. Yes, this is always my problem behind podiums. I am a tall, spirit person, but not very tall in stature. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. Uh, I was saying to myself, I'm learning so much uh, just by being here tonight. Uh, you know, how you first got connected to Black Women Thriving, that you had a connection um, to Public Allies, that you're from North Carolina, um, a place that we love and a place where we have family and visit often. Uh, so it is, it is just good to be here. Um, I feel connected. I feel like I am amongst kindred spirits and family and in a real community. So I thank you for welcoming me, welcoming me um, into this space to share more uh, about Black women thriving east of the river. Uh, I won't talk a whole lot about myself, uh, but, but really in terms of how I got here, it really does bring together so many experiences um, in my life. Yes, I was born in Ward 8, uh, and grew up in Ward 7, and today I live in Ward 7, and um, to me, uh, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity to do work that is impactful. Um, I've worked in government, uh, I've worked in nonprofits uh, for all of my career, and um, in the few, I've, I just celebrated one year with Black Women Thriving, so it started in 2019. And I just celebrated one year and it is pulling on all of the skill sets and many of the networks that I have uh, and and also just great hard work as well. So um, what does it mean? You know, 
what what does it mean for black women to thrive? Um, do any of you have insights on that? Mm, love that. Love that. Anything to add? I don't know how we get to see the chat or if there's anyone from online. To showcase yourself, whatever version of that is, if the brain can go the place to collapse and to allow herself to be supported and celebrated in all she is. I'm hearing authenticity, I'm hearing purpose, I'm definitely hearing the ability to, to show up fully um, as your full self. And I know that those are certainly things that this group of women um, who started Black Women Thriving East of the River, that they thought about uh, as they were convening. Um, so Jane Bancroft Robinson Foundation um, decided to look at some of the areas that they had some expertise in or connections to, and, and it was the connection to the cancer center and, and that, um, that there is a lot of, there are a lot of good jobs in healthcare. And so they knew that those were some connections that they had, but they did not want to leave, um, it up to just themselves to figure out how to be impactful. And so they convened a group of 28 women, uh, all who had ties to or lived in neighborhoods east of the Anacostia River. Uh, and they convened in 2009 and worked through the pandemic and came up with over 20 uh, ways to impact healthcare and um, workforce systems for the long term. So really that is what our work is about. It's about reducing cancer mortality and increasing health-related success. Uh, for Black women who live in Ward 7 or 8 of D.C., uh, and those who might have some kind of generational ties to it. Uh, because our work is impacting systems, we don't expect that it will only impact uh, women who live in Ward 7 and 8. If we're doing this work well, it does mean that Black women um, in D.C. and possibly even in other places will benefit from the work that we're doing just because um, it is focused on long-term change. Uh, I know um, Dr. Olinye earlier uh, gave us um, a lot about the theme of, of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and I, I like to also, you know, just talk simply as well. Uh, so I'll add, you know, just the, some simple definitions that I think of, especially as, as we are thinking about our, our workforce development work. And so, um, Let's say if someone is looking for a job in a healthcare system, um, equity would allow that person to have the same opportunity uh, that someone from another background or a more privileged background would have, uh, which means that they might need a different kinds of supports to be able to get there. Um, as we went through the process of engaging women to talk about what was really important and what did they need to succeed and thrive in their careers. I mean, they talked about things that we sound a bit familiar, things like mentoring, uh, things like I need to be able to get there, uh, things like childcare, uh, wages, uh, and, and not even just living wages, but family sustaining wages uh, in our area. I think we all know it's really expensive to live here. Uh, and even the living wage isn't enough um, for people to sustain families um, in this community. So talked about wages uh, and also talked about being able to have a level of flexibility um, that's needed within the work. And so again, like those probably aren't things that are new as you think about employment, but those are some of the things that when we spoke to women, uh, women around our tables, and we don't stop there. We we always go out and talk to more to ground truth the work that we're doing. Uh, but that's what they said would be important. Uh, and I was at a meeting earlier today where someone said, well, you know, sometimes it's just the little things. Uh, I think where she went to an, an event and um, they had hairpins in the bathroom uh, and, and a, a ponytail holder 
And she felt like that really uh, did consider um, some of the needs that she might have in terms of just like grooming or things that she might need to touch up her hair. And so sometimes it's small things as well. And we'll continue to talk to people about that. Uh, but that, that's the equity part. Um, diversity, uh, and I would say that that's evident too, as we look at different um, careers within healthcare, uh, we know that there tends to be a lot, if we talk about specifically, we're looking, looking at black women, um, there are a lot of black women in healthcare. Um, but when you look at management, you don't see a, as many. Uh, but when you look at some of the positions that are a bit lower or early career, um, there are a lot of black women. And so there's diversity, uh, but that's that's a case where there's no equity. People are in the system, but not necessarily in leadership roles or being able to have impact and influence um, in ways that those with more privileges have. Uh, inclusion is, is a feeling. Uh, and, and I would say that it, it definitely goes beyond a feeling, but a way to think about it is, is a sense of belonging, a sense of, of being treated with humanity. And I think that that could apply to the workforce situation as well as um, if you are receiving care. That is something that we've heard so often uh, from Black women who've been uh, getting cancer care. It's just that there needs to be more education so that providers and those within systems who are providing care can actually ensure that um, Black women are being treated with humanity. And, and that, um, so I would say that inclusion is something that comes up in that sense. Uh, I just, in terms of like, so our mission at Black Women Thriving East of the River is to reduce cancer mortality, and create health-related career opportunities for Black women in Ward 7 and 8 by transforming the culture of racially unjust and inequitable systems. Um, our vision is that we see a city where Black women are thriving in Ward 7 and 8 because they have access to racially equitable opportunities and resources that lead to optimal health. I am proud to say that just like me, um, there are, it, and it actually started much before me, people like Ms. Thelma who were involved in Around the Table. Uh, everyone who was involved in this work had some kind of connection, whether they be um, a cancer survivor or had a, were a caregiver or lived in the community. Um, and I, and in terms of how we do the work, that's very important as well. Uh, if there's a contract that we have to give, if there's um, work that we're looking to do, we want to first look at uh, Black women-led organizations and businesses east of the river. Um, and we know that because, well, we're actually getting a couple of new facilities uh, that are coming online uh, and some that just started to provide cancer care, but for a long time, there was nowhere um, to get cancer care uh, east of the river in DC. And so our work definitely does have to include all of the spaces where black women are able to get care. Uh, and just in terms of my, my own connection to the work. So both my parents uh, had cancer. Um, it's my very first adulting experience and realizing that, um, you know, sometimes uh, there are some things that are just beyond uh, our control. Uh, my mom um, had a really positive and, and early uh, experience um, with lung cancer. She's now a 20 plus year uh, lung cancer survivor. Uh, unfortunately, my dad um, passed away uh, from esophageal cancer and there was learning there too. Um, you know, my dad was a veteran and I got to see the kind of care that he received. Um, and also just walk this journey of accompaniment, of just ensuring that he was in a space where he make where he could make choices about how he wanted to be treated and and how he wanted to live um, for as long as he had to live. And so, I think when you're in a room uh, or the rooms that I've been in and Axe, who's been touched by cancer, so many people can share the same story, which is really why we're focusing on this work and want to see something different. And we're also very clear that. Um, 
there are many other um, issues, many other health issues uh, that Black women are managing and want to be able to certainly address cancer care. Um, but we think that the tools that they get from engaging with some of our programs will help them in other areas as well. So we have, our work is broken into a couple of different areas, broken into patient navigation uh, and um, workforce development. So, and, our, and even there's a, a breakdown there. So as we think about patient navigation, uh, there are, we call them interventions. Uh, some of them are based around education and awareness. Uh, some of them are really um, focused on working within healthcare systems and providers uh, to dismantle um, really this, this treatment that comes from being Black and being a woman. So education, but also influence so that systems change because of that. And then um, that third category is about infrastructure. What kinds of supports are needed, especially as it relates to like public financing um, so that women who need care don't have to bear as much of the cost of that care as they're going through and navigating the treatment. Um, on the workforce development side, um, we still ha we have systems interventions where we're talking to employers uh, and um, some programs that support women who are actually seeking to get jobs. We know that you know a, a lot of programs focus on training, uh, yet we also know that if we only train individuals, uh, we may come out with the same outcomes because the systems that they're going into will remain the same. And so that's why it's really important for us to, to work both ways, both with our work around cancer patient navigation and um, workforce development. Currently we have four active um, programs that we have. Uh, one of them is a scholarship program uh, for black women who are interested in health related careers. And uh, that right now is in a pilot phase. We've got nine women uh, who are various stages of their careers, as well as um, life. And we're learning a lot um, from them. We've awarded about $50,000 in scholarships, uh, and we're looking to open it up fully uh, sometime later this year, uh, hopefully the fall. Uh, so we're looking to share more information about that soon. Uh, but the goal in health-related for us means any job that can be done within a healthcare system. So it could be a provider, could be a doctor or a nurse, um, could be a researcher, or it could be someone who's doing IT uh, or someone who is doing, um, you know, a building engineer, but or someone who's pursuing entrepreneurship. And so it's really important. And it's also the scholarship itself isn't just limited to academics. Uh, it is really important that women are supported with being successful. And so that does mean being able to address some of the life circumstances that they have as well. So things like childcare, um, sometimes people need to purchase technology, uh, very important for us to um, be able to support that. Um, another intervention that we have is our Cancer Patient Bill of Rights for Black women, uh, which is really, um, a document, bless you, uh, <laughs> that outlines um, really what someone can do to get high quality care. Uh, sometimes people don't know things like they can get a second opinion. Um, sometimes people feel like they know what they can get, but they don't feel heard. So there's also some guidance on what happens if you feel like someone is not hearing you. Um, there's also information in uh, about clinical trials as an option because many people don't think of that first. Uh, so um, that is some work that is happening. Uh, there are materials being printed as we speak and, and we look to have like a broader uh, education campaign later this spring. Uh, our employer best practices is focused on talking to employers, lifting up what is working well and hopefully engaging employers around some positive peer pressure uh, to adapt practices that are more equitable for Black women. Uh, and then the last uh, intervention that's active right now is sustainable financing for patient navigation. Um, there's a lot of support, uh, but unfortunately, we're still in a space where if someone gets a cancer diagnosis, they may get a lot of contacts and calls, but 
there may not be as much coordination um, as there could be. And so we're really looking for a model. And also um, we're looking for a model that is going to really impact uh, mortality. And um, so we're looking for that and looking for a public source to finance that. Uh, we have been talking to women, again, uh, who've been going through the experience. I think this summer participated in one of our focus groups as well. And we'll continue to do that until we get something that we think is really gonna make a difference. How can you get involved? Uh, <laughs> certainly there's more information on our website. Uh, it's thrivingeotr.org. Uh, we are also, um, we started this month uh, on social media uh, doing a, a Her Story Matters campaign. And I think we'll keep that going on for as long as we can, just because we wanna highlight um, black women that are doing this work around workforce development uh, and cancer. And we want more people to know about them. Uh, and the last thing that we have going on currently is a survey um, for people who are navigators. Um, so working to help someone through their cancer care. We're really looking to find out um, what's happening. What could they use more of? Uh, what Where could there be more coordination? So certainly, that's a part of the work as well with refining what we do. Uh, I, um, that's, that is really um, a summary of the work that we're doing. And uh, again, we always look to do this work in partnership with everyone that is, has experiences that can be helpful. And we wanna be in a space where we're not duplicating any efforts. So that's why it's really important. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, momentarily for Q and A, um, our Howard students uh, do need to leave, so I want to make sure uh, that you heard about them before they have to depart. Um, and so, any questions that you have for Nakisha, please hold them because I have a few myself. But at this time, I would like to welcome our Howard University representative from the Howard University, uh, Kathy Hughes School of Communication, Ira White. He is working closely with the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Fund. And if I were to tell you what she's doing, then I would be taking away part of her speech. So please come forward and tell us about the great work that you're doing and how you're going to make us look even better. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, everyone. I am Nyayla White. I'm a senior advertising major from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I'm here to kind of talk about the amazing collaboration that. Howard University School of Communication is doing um, with the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Foundation. Um, so they, in our you know, major as advertising students, we have the ability to be able to put our expertise to the test and to actually be able to utilize all the things that we have learned to be able to help build other businesses. Um, this time around, you know, our amazing professor, Dr. Tyree, gave us the ability to personally be able to use our, you know, skills to be able to interact with local DC businesses and nonprofits. Um, and so I also have my amazing team over here, Courtney. And there were a couple businesses and nonprofits, but when they, when our professor spoke about Ms. Thelma's, it really had really put a lot of clarity on my heart that that was what I wanted to choose to be a part of. Um, when describing Ms. Thelma, um, Dr. Tyree just showed, told us about, you know, how much life um, that she has within her, all the amazing things she does and how like a room lights up when she's in it. Um, she spoke about the amazing connections Ms. Thelma had and, and how she was an amazing warrior. And I knew that with a queen like that, I had to be a part of the team to be able to execute her vision for her foundation. Um, so truly grateful to Ms. Thelma um, and everyone that helps support her because it truly does make everything that we do behind the scenes amazing. 
Um, so the stuff that we do do, um, we kind of help with a strategic communications plan. So this looks in, you know, the new logo, our amazing uh, coworker, Taylor, she created that logo, um, as well as, you know, we are working on getting stuff like brochures, new leaflets, um, social media, um, drafting new communications, just stuff so that, you know, the breast, uh, the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Foundation um, has the ability to reach larger and more amazing audiences because the amazing stuff I've learned about this foundation uh, while being, you know, with Miss Thelma and not just learning about the work that she does, but also learning about just the realistic state in which breast cancer um, is at. And I think that, you know, going to Howard University, you have access to so many amazing stories and experiences from all the amazing, you know, Black young women and men that go to my school. And I think being able to learn about what Miss Thelma does makes me realize, you know, there's more stories to be told. Um, so I am just really excited and, and proud to be a part of this collaboration. And I want to always say thank you to Ms. Thelma for just always just pouring so much knowledge into us and just allowing me to not only understand, you know, your brand more so that we're able to execute the communication better, but to also just really realize that there's just so much work within the nonprofit space that can be done as advertisers and marketers. Um, I think that there's something so enriching and rewarding to be able to help communities that look like myself, um, communities that look like my mother, communities that look like my father. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity and thank you guys so much. So thank you again um, so much. And we will be highlighting the students. And just so you, the young people will know the connection uh, and to um, uh, what you were saying, Nikisha, about your parents. Um, have lost both of your parents um, to- uh... Oh, my mom is still there. Oh, okay. Oh, your dad passed away, okay. Thanks for correcting it. Um, but having two parents that that have um, dealt with it and then to be working in that space, and then you've done a lot of work around workforce development with public allies and other places, and to bring all of that together to bear in a community that's dear to you, I think that's absolutely wonderful. Um, Cecily also lost a parent to cancer and the connection with Howard University. Her father attended Howard um, and we just passed Black History Month. So her father graduated ultimately from Yale University with one of the largest classes of Black architects um, at the time. So. All three of you, all of you have a connection to the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Fund and to each other. I wanted to share that before you departed. And of course, when homecoming is something you need a great speaker, you can always uh, contact Cecily. And she, she might give you the speaker speak, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the student speak. Mine, yes, and she might. <laughs> but um, thank you. And now, um, and I understand if, if you ladies um, have to leave, but if I can, if you need to want to stay longer and I can help you with your transportation, um, we will certainly do that. That's the least we can do. We realize you're students. And my treasure's sitting over there, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I wanted to return back to the Q&A um, section. And I don't know, because we we're recording, if you might, is it better if she returns back to the podium or can we ask her questions from where she's sitting? Yeah, I think it would be better um, to pick up the voices. Um, and is there anyone who can help me monitor the chat in case any questions come through? So, 
and I hope I didn't miss you saying this because I did get distracted a couple of times. Um, but tell me, well, let me put it another part in perspective. Um, why I am really interested in working with you. So I'm not for sure if um, the audience know or aware that Southwest DC had one of the country's largest urban renewal programs. Just immediately to my right is Delaware Avenue. It is considered the imaginary dividing line mm -hmm. in Southwest. I live one block away. So in the 50s and 60s, Congress felt that Southwest was a sore eye in the foregrounds of the Capitol. So it told the people, we are going to rebuild the neighborhood. So we're going to move you, tear down, rebuild, and move you back. More than 23,000 people, mostly African-Americans, were displaced. More than 1,000 businesses were destroyed. The effects of urban renewal is still badly felt in this community. And to know that what divides us, talk about equity, what divides us is a street when we all have the same common desires. And when you ask about how do we define thriving, and I, I didn't say anything because I thought, okay, let the audience speak. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that um, for me, thriving is more than just living. It's flourishing almost against the odds mm -hmm. and the opportunities that all of us should have to live the life that we really want, mm -hmm. not the life that we are forced to live because of our color, because of our geographical location, mm -hmm. because of the social determinants of health. But that's not uh, living its best. And it's the same when I look at breast cancer survivors, I'm thriving, I'm champions. I mean, I consider I'm a thriver and a champion because I'm not just living mm -hmm. every day. I get up with a purpose to flourish and to help improve other people's lives. And then the other part of that is why I'm interested because when the residents were displaced here, many of them moved to Southeast and to Berry Farms. And the sad thing, Berry Farm is going through the same thing. So they now moved all of the people out of there. So some of these people, some of our neighbors have been affected twice. Maybe they were children when they were living here and it was this place, or they've heard the stories about that their parents telling us we had this at one point. And then when they moved to Barry Farms, they're having to go through this again. The psychological effect that displacement does is something that I often wonder if we fully understand. It. And when we look at the violence that we have, you know, it, there's a relationship between poverty and violence. There's a relationship between when Tyrone, the Tykanisha, robs from the people that live their wealth on the war because they wonder, uh, why can't I at least have my fair share, not necessarily be wealthy? So anyway, as you can see, this is something that's dear to me and I can uh, go off on it, but I wanted you to know clearly why I had um, a passion and an interest to be part of East of the River.
because there's a correlation between the residents that I work with here in Southwest and uh, what, what you were doing. And because finally, a block from here, not even a block, right across M Street, they are getting ready to tear down all of that area. And so people will go through displacement again. And I'm sure many of the people, the residents, who moved to Southeast. So um, if there's a way that we can help follow them, then I am committed to that. And so all of that is, my question is, what do you find to be the greatest challenge? Because um, I know there are a lot of challenges. And how do you identify uh, where to start when you have so many challenges and limited funds mm -hmm. and limited staff? Yeah. Um, I, I honestly think, and you, you may have heard it while I was thinking, um, the greatest challenge is um, is mindset. Uh, and I think that both goes for people who live in communities that are under-resourced. Um, I said this earlier, if I believe everything that everyone said about what's expected of someone who was born in Ward 8 and grew up in Ward 7 and went to DC public schools, if I believed everything that they said, I probably wouldn't get up out of bed. And I think that there have to be ways that we we build up within the community, that we tell our own stories, um, that we're able to share that, yes, there are challenges, but everything isn't a challenge. And there are some things that are going well. So I, I think that's the greatest barrier. And I think on the other side, which you talked about a bit, you know, the linkages between um, violence and, and poverty. Uh, you know, I also think there needs to be some mindset change amongst people who have been more influential um, so that they understand that those are linkages and that you, you can't have a city or a downtown that's safe. Um, if we're not addressing some of the underlying issues, like why are people poor? Uh, and, and, and why do we see um, when there's more poverty, there's, there's more violence? And, and what can we do to address the long term? I, I think it has to happen on, on both ends. Um, yeah, does anyone else have any questions? Well, we certainly would like to invite you back uh, to share the progress uh, that you are making or that you have made because we know you're making some progress now, but at some point we'd love to hear the really great progress uh, that you have made. Thank you. And I look forward to celebrating more wins with you all as well. Thank you so much um, for the invitation. I'm appreciative. Okay. Thank you. So we have one other speaker and I'm not for sure if, if she is on the phone, uh, I'm sorry, on Zoom. Oh yes, you are there all the way from California. Oh my, Gwendolyn, that is really wonderful. Thank you, thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, this is Gwendolyn Mitchell, who is with the Moya Institute in California. So uh, we are grateful again for technology to be able to reach her. So. Gwendolyn, why don't you take it away and tell us about what the Moore Institute is, your mission, and how we can help the, with the project that you're working on. 
Thank you so much, Thelma. It really is a pleasure to be joining you. And I was simply applauding over here in the background as Nayela, I think that's how you pronounce her name, was talking about how inspired she was by the example that you set and all the wonderful things that she heard about you. And I happen to have had the opportunity to work with you on the Love Letters project that we do here at Moyo. Um, a couple of years ago, and and I want to just give you the surprise announcement that you are going to be one of the dynamic sisters that we spotlight this year uh, as a part of that workshop. So let me well, add my you. claps to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, well deserved, well deserved. What I will say right quick is that Moyo is a 501c3 organization, and we uh, offer heart-centered educational experiences that foster inner peace, happiness, well-being, creativity, connection, and oneness. And um, we have received a small grant to offer workshops to African-American women who are journeying with cancer. And the project is called the Love Letters to Our Bodies Project. And in this workshop, um, it's two sessions for four hours on each, each day. We really take a look at the mind-body-spirit connection. And um, we discuss, we have interactive polls where women uh, share information about early, ex early uh, life experiences. We look at how thinking and how caring emotional um, mm, damaging experiences actually affects our well-being. And in the workshop, I teach a few tools that make it possible to um, really support yourself going through the journey, including how to really increase the energy in your body, how to deal with anxiety with using a few hand movements and breathing exercises. And of course, we hear from sisters and their experiences, and we also craft love letters to our bodies. And I'd like to just share uh, very briefly uh, a reel that we produce that will give you an idea of what I'm talking about uh, in terms of the love letters to our bodies. These are some quotes from women who have uh, participated in the workshop. Thank you. Thank you. And what thank I will you. the workshops. So Brendan, can you just go over again? Um, the, or oh, admit share with us the eligibility requirements for participating in your workshops. Yes, yes, of course. So, and I'm just highlighting Moyo's website too, where there's more information available. First of all, I want to say the workshops are free and that um, 
you know, the grant makes it possible for us to make this available free. And it is for African-American women. And you can be uh, currently involved in a cancer diagnosis, be a, a survivor, a thriver. Um, and even we've had some caregivers attend as well in the past. And so that's, that's, I'm sorry. I, I was asking if we were losing you. I think your voice is fading in and out. You, okay. You did say that it, is this better? Um, yeah, I don't think it's your, this may necessarily be your system. Um, but you were saying oh. you could currently be a survivor. Um, yes. It, 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 you, a survivor. you can be a patient. You can be a survivor, a thriver, and we have had a few caregivers also participate in the workshops. Um, the, the important thing is that it's free. It's a very healing opportunity. And on the second day of the workshop, we actually um, craft the love letters uh, to our bodies and they become a part of a publication. So I wanted to show this. Um, there are actually two workshops. The first one is the 13th and 14th of April. And uh, for anyone who can participate then, they can register here. And uh, we'll be doing another workshop on the 27th and 28th of April. And the registration opportunity is here. And after these love letters are actually written, they get compiled into a booklet. And each woman's letter is spotlighted in the booklet, along with a photo. And for the women who don't want to um, have their photo included, we just show a back of the head shot to um, protect their privacy. So all of those are options. It's a very healing workshop. Um, it's a, a very beautiful workshop, and we would be delighted for uh, people to participate. And, and just for clarity for the audience, because you were fading in and out a couple of times, you have to be either a cancer survivor, caretaker, patient, but what about if you're not a cancer survivor or one of the two that I just mentioned? Are you welcoming uh, yes, women? We've, we've had people, well, I've been told that this workshop is so powerful that I should be offering it to everyone, whether they have a journey with cancer or not. And so we won't take, um, we won't exclude anyone. Um, we give first priority in terms of space available to the women who are actually in the journey itself. But anyone who's interested in learning more, we've had people from the American Cancer Society take the workshop, staff members uh, take the workshop, for instance, um, and other uh, medical personnel also take the workshop. Thank you. Um... I'm not for sure if uh, it's interesting that you were talking about the healing uh, that it brings. And I'm not for sure if you heard Cecily, our vocalist, talk about the song that she created and sort of what it was based on um, healing and all of that. Did you, were you I'm... on the line to hear that? I missed that part because I was making a presentation Maybe. for another organization. But I would love if you were willing to share the recording afterwards, I'd love to hear it. Certainly I will. Okay then, thank you so much Gwendolyn. And I look forward to sending this out on my distribution list. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Okay. So thank you. This is my webmaster, Sergio Jimenez, and he's actually working tonight in different capacities. So let's give Sergio a big hand.
So all those campaigns that you see coming out, Sergio is the person who works with me um, to send them out. Um, let me, uh, so we're gonna have a solo by Cecily, and then we will end for tonight. And while she is prepping, again, I want to thank my young students, friends from Howard University School of Communications. Thank you, our guest speaker, and sharing about us, the work that you were doing, Nikisha Neal Jones at um, Black Women Thriving East of the River. And because the spotlight is on you and East of the River, if there are other things that you would like for me to share about your organization on our distribution list, please do not hesitate to send it. And I feel very bad when Gwendolyn uh, mentioned that I was being spotlighted. East of the River invited me <laughs> to be spotlighted and I haven't responded with the information that I need, but I am very much looking forward to it. It's just from the time that I was invited, I had four major events and I was just overwhelmed. It's it's not that I didn't appreciate, you know, we all like to be recognized and up in um, print and all of that. So thank you. I will get back to you. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. And of course, Alejandra, thank you for being by my side and for working with us around the health disparities, Black and African American and Latino women. And of course, I look forward to continue working with you. And my uh, assistant treasurer, board member, Kathy DeVoe is here. Um, who lost her mom uh, to, to cancer. And so we all have a connection to it in some way or another, and some of us have even a more direct uh, connection to it. And Kathy and I worked together for years at twin institutions. She retired from the International Monetary Fund. So the IMF and the World Bank are twin institutions. And I want to thank Mary Thomas for helping us to set up this beautiful room. We've mentioned Sir Joe. And to the rear is my grandson, who's wondering how much longer do we have to be here? <laughs> um, and so, and Jim, of course, again, um, thank you and Edna Hicks, and the other young lady from Malawi, Pumale, who was very helpful. So please convey our thanks um, to St. Matthews. And now it is all yours, Miss Cecily. <laughs> So I wanted to end this evening uh, by doing something, one that will work well a cappella because I didn't want to have to bother with any more sound things. But also, uh, I I wanted to, since it's Women's History Month, I like a uh, female composer other than just myself. And so I wanted to do a song by uh, Nia Simone. And so I want to ask you guys for some audience participation. Is that cool? I just want you to snap with me, so we're going to be right here. Thank you. So I'm going to thank, I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. Okay? Here we go. I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. I wish I could break all the chains. Hold me, I say all things that I think I should say. Say them loud, say them clear, for the whole wide world to hear. 
Oh, I wish I could share all the love that's in my heart. Remove all the bonds that keep us apart. Oh, I wish you could know what it means to be me. Then you see and agree that every man should be free. Oh, I wish I can give all I'm longing to give. I wish I could live how I'm longing to live. I wish I could do all the things that I can do. Though I'm way overdue, I'd be started anew. Well, I wish I could be like the birds in the sky. How sweet it would be if I found out to fly. I swore to the sun and looked down at the sea. Then I sing, cause I know, hey, then I sing, cause I know, hey, sing, cause I know all the time I sing, cause I know all the time I sing. Cause I know how it feels to be free. Thank you. I love that. Great way, great way to end a wonderful evening. I hope you've all learned something, particularly we've learned more about uh, Black women thriving east of the river. And uh, so feel free to visit them on their website, which is at, I've noted it on the bottom of the program. Uh, so please visit the Thelma D. Jones Breast Cancer Fund website at www.tdjbreastcancerfund.org. And there are some wonderful handouts around on the table and over to my left. So please feel free to uh, take some of the handouts. And thank you again, Jim, and the staff congregation at St. Matthew's Lutheran Church. So. Good night, everyone, and thank you again. Good night. Oh, I should say good night to everyone that's on, on Zoom. There's quite a few faces up there that I recognize. <laughs>